Thanks. I really appreciate you spending your lunch hour talking about methods and methodology. I think uh, it's a wonderful thing about working in higher education is the privilege of having the time, even though we don't have a lot of time, but we do make time to talk about such issues that normally lead people to walk away from me at a party. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a great way to get the chips, but uh, it leads for a lonely time because not too many people like to talk about such things. So uh, today I'm going to talk about grounded theory, but before I talk about um, that specifically, I just wanted to say that I think it's uh, increasingly important before anyone decides on the method or approach that they want to adopt in terms of their research to have an understanding of the conversations that are happening in the broad field of research and then if you've decided to go qualitative research in, in that area. I think that that's the important first step before deciding on any one approach or method to doing research. For instance, um, well, I, and I guess I, I wasn't sure who the crowd would be, but some sort of basic reading that I think has to happen before you decide on which method precisely you want to adopt would be um, the SAGE Qualitative Research Handbook. All four editions are different, and uh, they're incredibly expensive. I wouldn't necessarily buy them, but if you can borrow one or get your hands on them, from 1994 to 2000 to 2005 to 2011, especially the introduction by Norm Denson and Ivana Lincoln, offer uh, a good view on how the landscape continues to change and evolve. So I'd say that that's um, a really important reading. The next one that I've found um, that helped me understand a bit better and position myself was this small one. I like this book because it's so accessible. It's uh, Critical Constructivism by Joe Kintelow. And I liked it just, again, because it was so accessible and it helped theorize what I'm already thinking, but I maybe didn't have the language for it or realize that other people think this way too, which is always good. Um, it's fun to not be alone. Um, and then finally, this book for when you want to procrastinate and you should be doing more work, but you want to now read more because it suits for... Um, procrastination reasons. Um, this one is good. It, it's by uh, Harry Walcott. Walcott's got a sort of infamous history to him as well. He's an interesting person to study, even if one wanted to go down that route in terms of ethics and ways of reporting on research. He's uh, an amazing s story. Um, but this particular book basically tells you to start writing. And, so, and it's short, so you can only procrastinate the length of the book, and I found it useful, especially in my doctoral work, to, okay, I can't procrastinate anymore, I better start writing, and so this one, I found it useful for that. Um, as well, I think if you're not familiar with the triple crisis of representation, legitimation, and praxis that took place in the qualitative field in the early millennium, um, you, you need to know this part of the evolution of methods and to, to give you a, a methods and approaches in the qualitative field itself. So the crisis of representation really called into question our ability to, to re-present reality, however you want to conceptualize that, that any written account or any account really could never mirror in an isomorphic way exactly what happened. They're all interpretations and they're all... Um, you know, they're all uh, put into question and can be called into question. So the crisis of representation, how do we represent life? Um, legitimation, how do we argue how good or valid our findings are? And also the crisis of practice, how do we put into practice uh, or changes in practice based on the findings that we found? So based on our findings, how can we then go out and advocate for changes? And so that, those, uh, that triple crisis, I think, is a very important uh, place to begin in terms of uh, your research. And as a result of that triple crisis, we've seen a real change in um, the qualitative landscape, again, where uh, increasingly people are calling for relationally driven 
research. We see the rise of uh, indigenous research. I think this book might be a good place to start as well for that, if, if that's what you're interested in. Place in Research, Theory, Methodology, and Methods by Eve Tuck and Marcia McKenzie. Again, a really expensive book. All the methodology books seem to be prohibitively priced. Um, you get to know someone who has the luxury of a tenure track or tenure job and borrow their books. Or, or try the library uh, as well. Or there are also dark places on the internet that allow such access that may not be legal, but uh, definitely for their knowledge. Um, so that's where you have to begin. You have to understand how these uh, crises and conversations and debates within the field have fueled a reinvigoration of qualitative research and what's possible. Uh, again, there's uh, increasingly we, there are calls to action. We, it's not enough just to study the world as a sort of fetishization of the exotic to write it up and then be done. That the, increasingly we want more than that. We want a uh, further justice-oriented research. So. Th that's where I'm coming from. Uh, to give you an idea, I think we've seen a rise in public, publicly engaged participatory and indigenous epistemologies precisely because they're one part of the answer to the crisis that I alluded to earlier, that, earlier, that triple crisis. Now, that's on the, that part just kind of to get um, well-rounded in your knowledge of where the field is going and where it's been. Uh, and you can dig deeper, uh, obviously, and I'll get to some of that specifically about grounded theory. But in terms of grounded theory, most of you who, if you think you're doing grounded theory, you probably are not, and that's okay. Most people who write and say they're doing grounded theory are using some of the techniques and methods of grounded theory, and, and that's fine. Um, what grounded theory does offer is, and it's very appealing, especially I find as a novice researcher, is it's prescriptive. The earlier works of it tell you, um, and, and that's changed in the new models that I'm going to get into, but if you're familiar with the 2006 or pre-2006, any grounded theory books basically tell you step by step how to do something. Um, there may be three steps to coding or two. Um, they may approach it slightly differently, but basically they kind of outline, which is a, a good thing when you're struggling to know what to do with mountains of data. Uh, it's a bad thing if you strictly adhere to them because they're the steps. There's no sort of paint by numbers way of doing research. I think perhaps maybe in painting, and I don't know, I don't paint, but it might have been useful to do a paint by numbers to see how the colors work together and then quickly move beyond that. If, if that was of use to you, that's what strictly following the prescriptions of any grounded theory book would be like. Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't follow them exactly. I think they're useful for your master's and your doctorate. And then as you move on, like I would say I do grounded Spooner. Uh, it's, we adopt and adapt, and I think that that's what's important about. And what's useful about grounded theory is that it's very open to that. You can adopt and adapt it to your own situation. But uh, even some of the old debates that we've come to take for granted as a truth are not no longer true. For instance, we used to talk about, well, you, if you're doing grounded theory, you should specify which of the three. Are you doing sort of a Glazerian grounded theory? Are you doing uh, Corbin and Strauss, Straussarian? Or are you doing Charmaz? But that, that, that's not even true anymore. Uh, mostly, if you look at their new versions, uh, there's a fourth edition of uh, Corbin and Strauss's book, Basics of Qualitative Research, Techniques, Procedures, and Developing Grounded Theory, and also Charmaz's second edition of her book, uh, Constructing Grounded Theory. You could speak of these as the same method now. They're the same approach. They're constructivist versions of grounded theory. And so I would say now the only thing you could logically uh, kind of talk about are two versions and that's Glazer's version, and then the newer versions of grounded theory all are converging around some form of constructivist grounded theory. And even the old ideas that, um, say like Corbin and Strauss had three steps to coding, that's not true anymore either. 
they, they only have basically, uh, they don't even talk about axial coding anymore or anything like that. Um, in, in the newer versions, it's more about um, open coding and then some process-oriented coding. So, um, like those old truths that you may have read, even in, say, 2007, in some other books, they're, they're not really true anymore. And that's the thing about any of these approaches. They're continually evolving, just as the field is continually evolving as it's disrupted, contested, and reimagined. And I think that's the beauty of the work that we do, is that it's continually in that process of disruption, contestation, and imagination. Um, yeah, so I, I'll go a little bit further, and then I think we're a nice small group. We should just have a conversation. And I don't pretend to be the great guru of um, grounded theory. In fact, I think at some point you um, method, method, methodological and methods approaches to uncovering some understanding of any social phenomenon are adapted to the point where I use a lot of techniques in grounded theory. I'm not sure. I guess I would still call myself a grounded theorist, but I'm a critical, constructivist grounded theorist with a strong action component. So uh, it is really, as Clifford Gertz uh, talked about, the blurring of the genres. Um, what's important, though, is to know how to blur them and why you're blurring them. I think that that's always the important part. You know, master's or PhD defense, I'm less an adherent to any right way of doing anything. It's more, what is the rationale for why you're not doing it this way or why you are doing it in a certain way? Um, so, again, I'm not sure if people are interested in just some of the techniques for coding data because it's a, well, it's a depressing prospect when you get all this data back, usually interview transcripts. I, I remember when I first got mine back, I was excited about hearing the participant speak a lot during the interviews. Less so when I had to transcribe those interviews. In fact, I started to hate their voice um, and, and uh, really started to wonder, did I really need to get them to keep talking about something? And, and it was useful, but transcription is a painful process to me. Um, and then it's even more daunting when you have to make sense of it somehow. And they're all constructions. We, they are. And um, we have to approach it some way, and I think that grounded theory offered that, a safety valve for how to approach it. Well, here are some tried and tr true ways of doing an approach to making sense of, of a bunch of data. And I think once you get in and you decided that you want to do grounded theory, then you should start to understand how the method came about. How, how did it come? Well, it's the marriage of two unlikely things. It's the positivism of Columbia in Glazer married to the newer approaches the Chicago School, basically, social interactionism in Strauss. So uh, you, you know, it's 50 years old. You know, in 1967, it was an answer to nothing. There was positivist research or nothing. And the other one didn't count anymore. It wasn't codified. So Glazer really set out to codify qualitative research in the same way that the positivists had codified quantitative research. So if you're reading the 1967 book, it's an objective version of grounded theory. And as the theories evolved, so has our understandings of constructivist ways of viewing the world. And uh, the newer versions are very different than the 50-year-old versions, and that's a good thing. Um, I'm always reminded of people who say, well, I'm glad I'm not uh, Freudian, and I'm glad I'm Freud, because I can still change my mind. Or you know, it's like that for any of these. I'm glad I'm not the disciple of it and more the originator of it because I can keep changing my mind, whereas we tend to kind of strictly adhere to one. And I'd say the method wasn't meant to be used that way. It is very much, you, it should be adapted to your situation. And again, as long as you understand why you're doing what you're doing. So um, I think I'll stop for a minute there, but if people want to get into the nitty gritty of actually doing grounded theory. Like if you want to actually be doing grounded theory, that means that you need to be doing theoretical sampling, something that we often don't do. Uh, for one, it's uh, more time consuming. It's harder to explain to ethics. 
Um, most people are not saturating categories because you just simply don't have the time or money. Um, we're not carrying on our analysis to uh, a process model with a core category and a, it's usually a gerund like becoming or uh, cultivating or things like that and developing an actual theory that takes into account all of the categories that you've found in some framework. And it's usually process over time. If you're not doing that, that's okay. Uh, but understand that you're not doing a full-blown grounded theory, that you're using the methods and techniques of grounded theory to get at data analysis, which is what I find most people are doing, and that's okay. So yeah, what, what do you want to talk about, maybe? <laughs> what would be more useful? I just have a question. I don't want to set this mm. off from what we talked about. But <clears throat> you said that uh, Glasser originally was trying to um, mimic the other theories in, in the coding. Of the positivist the sort of, the yeah. The positive. And would you say that that, that isn't actually a value because it, it does go towards qualitative? And, and so then um, can you explain why what the open coding is and why that's a better fit? Well, they they had uh, sort of open coding and constant comparative in '67 too. It's it's more, it's very stepwise and it assumes that there's, an a sort of an objective, you're you're still striving for some form of objectivity, and I think what it allowed was to, it's an important stepping stone, in the evolution of the acceptance of of qualitative research, so uh, it basically says, hey, we can be as scientific as you. And this is social science, just like statistics and uh, positivism is social science. Um, so in some ways, it's kind of more rigid. And it mirrors other things. If you follow, uh, in 1985, Ivana Lincoln and, Gu Lincoln and Guba mirror sort of the four um, great things we want from, from positivist research. So they mirror... Uh, objectivity and reliability and validity and uh, generalizability, they, they kind of come up with four mere terms for that. Um, and by 1989, they invent their own new ones that could have been invented without ever having heard of positivism. So I think this is a normal sort of dialectic that happens. We kind of counter with something that matches the scientific rigor as it's perceived to be and then later people can then evolve on that um, to, for them to become on their own right. It's sort of, you know, no longer are we playing tennis on their court. We're playing our own game on our own court, if there even is a court. Uh, and I think that that's important to kind of to understand. There's, what are we waiting? Uh, there's one other book that I think people should read. It's a very... Uh, it's kind of a difficult read, but it's called Theoretical Sensitivity, and it was written by Glazer, and I think it's useful to understand uh, theoretical coding to its full extent with the core category and the process model of developing a theory that most people, again, this is only of interest if you really want to do grounded theory. But if you're adapting just the methods and techniques of grounded theory, then I think that it's... It's a different conversation. Mark, do you know why it's called grounded? What, what is it? What, why was yeah, I think that's a really great thing. It was grounded theory because they were. It's an answer against the armchair theorizing that before you can develop a theory, you have to go on the ground mm -hmm. and meet people and talk and go to the context-rich places and develop the theory from that inductive space. Uh, so in that way, I think it's had a, a real mark. It's left a real mark in terms of how we think about developing qualitative research that few would question that you have to do that now. You have to go down and actually start from the cases and then move from there. So it's, in that way, it's, you're grounded in the context, and then later you're also grounded in the data. And yet the categories are something are abstract. Yeah, so they want you to start with the data and then slowly abstract until you get to a large sort of meta theory, if you take it all the way. So the, abs the abstractions are coming from the... From grounded in the data. In the, that's the thinking, rather than... Yeah. In yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you do it according to Glazer, you know, you wouldn't even take, you don't transcribe interviews. So you will remember trust in emergence and you will hear it enough times if it's important that it'll kind of bubble up. It's less of a co-construction and it's more of if you trust in emergence, it will come. Um, Glazer also talks about not doing... Um, uh, say a lit review because they don't want you to preconceive they don't want you to have any preconceived notions about what you should find or not find in the field and in fact your question shouldn't even be set so it all began because they were curious about why hospitals don't talk about death and dying like that's how it began they did a project on why is it that no one talks about death and dying and they looked at it from every perspective and that that's also important that theoretical sampling Okay, well, do patients not talk about it? Is it the families that don't talk about it? Is it the nurses, the doctors? And in this case, it's everybody sort of colluded to not talk about death and dying. And then uh, Glazer goes away and codifies what they did in a sort of uh, instructional manual kind of. And that's the birth of grounded theory. Yeah, I, I like that. I wonder, is there a risk then that the, the person who is then theorizing misses their own body experience in what it is that they're making sense of? Yeah, I think... Because they're, they're trying to avoid preconceived ideas? There's that, would it make you, a person feel maybe that they are? That they, it's possible to avoid preconceived ideas? Yeah, I think that that's the knock on Glazer is that it's still sort of an ob assume some type of objectivity yeah. that uh, you're not imposing yourself on the data, but you, you are, like... And then an answer to that one, I know even I wrote about it, is that it could be that the extant literature leads to greater theoretical sensitivity too. Because as you read a diverse array of research in the field that you're interested in, it may lead you to be more sensitive to issues you might have missed. So um, there, with every prescription of grounded theory, there's a way of not doing it and then still functioning. And as long as you understand that these are modifications you're making to the actual method or methodology. If, if you're following grounded theory, like with capital GT, you're actually doing grounded theory. It's a methodology as much as a method. But most people are doing small GT. Like they're doing grounded theory using some of the techniques because, like I said, it, most of it, it happens in, in graduate school. You're going to get a bunch of data, and that's a scary prospect. I, I think it's the same with teachers to be. I, I find that they want to know. Just could you tell me the five steps to what I need to do to do it right? And I, and I understand that it's it's a scary proposition to say you're going to be left alone with a bunch of students and now you got to teach. And so people tend to want this five steps, but those five steps won't work as soon as you start interacting with students, and you realize that it might work for Jane, but not for Johnny, and so forth. But. Hopefully that's of some... Mind you, there's a lot of faith um, in the existence of the five steps. So even if you can uh, um, challenge or disrupt or d uh, debate the, it's the possibility of such a thing existing, there, there is an underlying faith sure. that, that there exists somewhere in the ether and that somehow others know it and just won't uh, tell it so. And I think the same thing can apply to research methodology. So I wonder, Mark, could you say a little bit more about that um, how is this blurred and why is it blurred? You know, the, the, the rationale for how you're doing what you're doing. I think that's a really useful place for everyone, but uh, especially grad students who I think are overwhelmed by the number uh, and scope of the choices that they have to uh, defend. Sure. Even at the very beginning when they're not really sure what's happening. Well, and I think that that underlies the need to do a whole lot of reading. Yeah. But uh, in terms of, well, the field is moving that way too. It used to be that constructivists were uh, satisfied with just seeing the world through another's eyes, attempting to do that. I, I just want to understand the world through that con concept of Verstechen or what I can't ever pronounce it, but the German word for understanding or something. But 
or understanding through your eyes? We're all apparent, we are all visualizing it in our brains, right? Yeah. You know so like. uh, it used to be that that was enough, that these accounts would be enough, but increasingly, uh, I think from the somewhere around the new millennium to 2000, and again, these are arbitrary spots to put them at, but somewhere around the late 90s, early 2000s, people are start to grow dissatisfied with that, that that's not enough. So there's a new call to action within constructivism itself, which lends itself well to the critical social sciences anyway about locating power and, and uh, seeing where some are being abused. There's always a power differential where somebody's getting you know, fire trucked over somebody's uh, dominating others and to uh, Critical social science has always had it as a view of kind of lifting the veils of oppression. And so you, I think they start to mirror and then you have the um, emergence of participatory ways of uh, conceptualizing research. And I think that these are natural things to put together if you understand c critical social science, if you understand constructivism, and you understand uh, participatory approaches to action research and, and to research itself. Now, none of this uh, just, like it gets developed over years, it's okay to not know. I, I love Fatty Lather, right beyond what you know. I, I think that that's a great way to uh, justify a look. We, none of us really know. There's no ultimate foundation upon which to base knowledge claims. You, you gotta buy into one or another. Even if you're a positivist, you're buying into that sort of received view that there is a world out there to measure. Um, an another quote that I, I love uh, is, facts only speak when interrogated, and they always answer in the language in which they are spoken to. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's a beautiful way of talking about how we are part of the research process, and if I'm putting on my critical lens, I'm going to see power. I, you know, that's the point of it. And if I'm putting on a constructivist lens, I want to see the world through your eyes. And if I'm putting on a participatory lens, I want to engage. The participants have to have some engagement with and, and say over the project. And so um, I think that, that those things naturally go together. And there are other ones. There's a, like in, in the, the Eve Tuck and Marcia McKenzie's book, they talk about new materialism and indigenous ways, uh, postmodern spatial turn. And f further uh, confusing people, I think, is the different usage, usages of terms. Like post-positivist. Most people put post-positivist either as just a reinterpretation of positivism, where it's kind of based on Karl Popper and you're looking at falsification rather than uh, verification, and where we go from 100% predict predictability to probability. Some people put post-positivism is just a re-articulation re of positivism. And then others, like I noticed uh, Tuck and McKenzie put post-positivism with constructivism. So I don't, uh, it's no surprise to me that students would be confused when the sort of big writers in the field are not positioning the words to mean the same thing uh, or the concepts to mean the same thing. I, I tend to follow uh, Lincoln and Guba and, and others that post-positivism is just a re-articulation re of positivism and where we say positivism today we actually mean post-positivism. We're talking about probability models and falsification. You reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And that's basically based on Karl Popper's work. But I can see why people would be confused, and there's a confusion also because it's not a static thing. The landscape continues to change on the very ground upon which you're set. It's like right now, things are changing. Michelle Fine had a great way, you know, as I'm typing this email to you now, Ivana, uh, things are changing already. So just as I'm uh, sort of writing these down as a static thing, it's a, they're reflecting a dynamic process that's always changing. And I find that in the conversations that I'm having with colleagues and there's always a reimagination of the field.
But a big one for me is journal articles. I think that there's a change that you're going to see that journal articles will cease to be seen as the only sort of artifact of a research project that's valuable and counted. We, we see it already, I think, that increasingly as community-engaged scholarship takes hold, that the products, indigenous scholarship as well, that the products are much more relational and they could be changes in practice, um, different ways of doing things that never lead to a journal article. And I think as some of the materials, or some, some of the engagement by Indigenous scholars and people who are working with Indigenous communities, it would almost be unethical to have that be the final product of what you've done. Some individual journal article that's not meant for the audience in which you were researching with, uh, with whom you were researching, I should say. So uh, that's a great area of debate currently. There's even a site, Community Engaged Scholarship for Health, that will peer review anything but a journal article. Uh, these are exciting times. Um, the counter to exciting times, why is there always a counter? Unfortunately, that's the push and pull of the world we live in. That makes it fun, I guess, too. Um, is audit culture, is it growing? The, uh, increasingly, these decisions aren't being done. It's uh, in collegial structures that they're meant to happen. So. The arbiter of the arbiter and authority and, and of quality should be the discipline structures. It should be in our uh, peer review committees and in, and in our disciplinary structures like the different professional organizations we belong to. And increasingly it's auditors, like accountants are deciding what counts as research or not. And they are, they're counting journal articles and then not just journal articles but they have to be in certain tiered journals and uh, H factors are looking at citation factors and the money you're getting uh, based on these publications and, and so you, you have uh, whole realms of research that aren't counted and don't count under these models and they're everywhere the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia you, you get very strange things that happen so in Australia or in New Zealand, let's say there's, I was just recently talking to Sandra Gray in New Zealand, uh, and she's talking about how um, because they value internationalization, so indigenous we research is devalued because it's local, it's national. Um, you even have people who are writing, up, there used to be someone who studied New Zealand labor movements and published in New Zealand journals because it's of interest to New Zealanders. In, very good research. Well, that person now studying American labor movements and publishing in American journals because they're rated higher. And they're tying money to the ratings that the individual researchers and their departments and faculties are getting. And this is happening in at least 14 countries that I know of across the world. And it affects us because we tend to influence each other. There's um, at least three processes by which we start to resemble each other. One, there's coercive isomorphism, so governments with similar neoliberal ideologies demand it. You won't get this money unless we rank order you and we benchmark you to see how well you're doing according to all the other universities. And we're going to pay the major ones more money, the ones who are doing better and the ones who are doing less well, less money, which leads to a greater stratification, right? Because you can imagine the next time those with less money are going to do even less well according to these benchmarks. Internationalization, uh, tier one journals only, th things like that. That's one process, coercive isomorphism, where the funder governments tell the organization you have to change. And it's coercive because they have the money. They, they have the power to do that. Um, the other two ways that we begin to resemble each other are mimetic isomorphism, which is where we willfully try to look like the organizations we see as doing well. And so as they're ranked order by McLean's or Times Higher Education, and they're ranked on the same scales that I've been talking about, publication in tier one uh, uh, journals, your H factors, your amount of money you're getting, as these things uh, happen and the universities are ranked, we want to emulate them. We willfully say we want to be like Oxford. We want to be Harvard of the North, which I've heard said about us, which is absurd. Why would we want to be that? 
And then the, the last one is through normative isomorphism because we're all similarly educated and we all belong to the same professional bodies. So that when I go to, or when we go to a conference, say uh, AERA in Washington coming up, we're going to meet, all our scholars are going to be from, the scholars we meet are all going to be from the countries that are already under this sort of audit culture and that spreads. That kind of thinking spreads and I see it even here where our province, our auditor even says, that, now this is an auditor, somebody who's supposed to be dealing with money is telling us how we should measure research. Well that's a direct affront to academic freedom. It's, a, it's a, actually an end run around it because we're supposed to decide what's good or not. And, and those have led to great rich debates. Uh, we should have these rich debates amongst each other about what is worthy, what is good research, what counts, and, and that, that should be contained there. And as soon as you take it out of that domain and place it in an accountant's hand, and I'm not blaming accountants, accountants are fine, but they ought to deal with money. As soon as you take them out of that and all of a sudden now they're deciding what quality is, what research indicators matter, well then you're taking that decision away from the disciplinary bodies that ought to be making and, the, and who are informed to be able to be, make the choices, to be able to say, yeah, you're right, you know, the map you make or the advocacy work you did in terms of educating uh, people about standardized testing or something counts, that counts, we like that. Like in our faculty, I think we have, when I compare our faculty's criteria document, I think we're so well positioned and so light years ahead of where too many faculties have failed chasing uh, the false sort of promise of these key performance indicators that lessen and limit what is available to you in terms of methodological choice and, uh, and possibility and imagination. Do we want to talk about something else? I don't know. Ground of theory? Is it the short answer to how to blur and why? <laughs> yes. No, well, it's about the rationale for how you're choosing to do what you're doing. Yeah, I, I understand them as they're presented in the books, which is usually um, for heuristic value, they're presented in a very ideal type. And in real life, that's not how they're done in practice. And to understand why you can mix certain things. So if you want to uh, do social justice work, let's say, it's, it's probably going to have some criticality to it. And uh, it will probably involve the participants with whom you're working with, uh, which give it a sort of participatory feel. And then if you're co-constructing knowledge, if you don't think that there's one knowledge out there, uh, one reality out there, then you probably some form of constructivism is involved. Um, okay, but that appears to be understanding what your place is in that conversation. Even if you are a child playing with pebbles on the shore of the undiscovered yeah. ocean, right? You, you still have to be able to position yourself in yeah. that larger context. And I think the only way to get to that is to be reading and then doing, uh, and both. Forever, though. Yeah, forever. It does, because yeah. once you get there, you the place is gone. Yes. <laughs> it's gone over there now. Yeah, it seems to me like it, have to, it has to come from, if it's coming, I really love the, your discussion of in, uh, audit culture in, in significance in relation to grounded theory. Like it makes so much, everything kind of comes together really well. I'm just wondering if, it, if we're interested in the, uh, sorry, I have to thank you. <laughs> So the arbitration, you're saying, should come be within the field, which it seems that grounded theory is really attempting to do, starting uh, from this grounded experience. But then, it's, as Val says, it's always then connected to uh, positioning oneself, and it's almost that you're always having to, I don't know, but there's me something within daily practice. I no, 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 I just, I wasn't claiming to know a lot here. It just seems that within... Uh, 
there's a closer to the body kind of moment with and there's a lot of movement within our perception uh, and we either feel we, I guess we feel degrees of potential in in the midst of perception I think and perhaps just expanding that capacity or the degree of potential that's felt I don't even know what I'm saying but so that there isn't that automatic connection to an already determined category maybe yeah. so I, yeah, no, I think there's definitely, uh, that reminds me, you, you need to be open and flexible. That if you're in grounded theory and in any other way, I think, in life, you it's best to be open and flexible. But certainly as a grounded theorist, there's no theory to hold on to. Like, that's another thing. As you develop this theory, they're always tentative. They're always waiting for new information, and then you modify the theory so that you should never be attached to it in that way that... It's uh, continually modifiable, and you're always looking for its fit, relevance, and workability. And that c can change, de depending if it's not working, then there's something wrong. The, uh, central to this thing is that it has to fit, be relevant, and workable, and always modifiable. And that's the ground of the theory. Mm -hmm. I, I think the audit culture is a lot bigger than... It's not just in research methods, it's everywhere in society. It's standardized testing in the school system. It's uh, we, we've it's kind of the it's three things intertwined. It's a neoliberal attitude that everything's a, a market, and the market has an inherent morality, and that we're all individual actors within a, a market. Yeah. And, and then and oh, then it God. gets applied <laughs> through new public management techniques, where we try to replicate the market in places that don't. Uh, to normally the public spaces like the university or education or many other services the government offers, they're not based on the market and yet we overlay a market ideology on top, which uh, causes very uh, drastic things to happen. Like we want the, to encourage precarious employment. We, do, we, we want to be able to interchange people, hire them, let them go, uh, which we've seen in the academy, which again very much limits the kinds of research that are open to them. Because if you're employed and you depend on that money and you can be let go for any reason and it never has to be articulated, you just don't get hired again for the next time that session's available. Well, chances are you're not going to be doing anything but safe, conservative research and teaching. Because you're not, structurally, you're being limited to those options if you want to continue to eat and be f and feed your family, let's say, uh, and that's so. There's new, new public management techniques do that. They they want as much as they can to casualize labor, and they want to uh, create incentives and disincentives that mirror the market. And uh, there's also more concern for orienting things as a c consumer. So you see this student transformed into a consumer, which are all things that we see. This is right before our eyes. And then the other part you need to do is strengthen output measures because you're casualizing labor. You're also devolving all kinds of budgetary decisions as much as you can to the unit, but then you hyper vigilate, uh, you're hyper vigilant on what their outputs are. So you want performance indicators, you want uh, audit culture basically. That's why we, we create in the system a mistrust of those who are there to give it, to deliver it, to, to work in it. So it's um, dispositioning the researcher and the subject that you're researching. And, and the types of things that are available to you to research. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, critical research is not as available to you because uh, you, only few have the privilege of tenure and academic freedom. And uh, it's all degrees of social capital, for instance, I have lots of it. I'm a white male who's tenured in a, in a faculty that doesn't have um, uh, sort of enrollment pressures. Like we're in the faculty of Ed, we don't have enrollment pressures, so we're not under Democlates' sword sort of hanging from us that we could cut your program at any time, so you better shut up, basically. Uh, same with if you're not, if you're part of the casualized labor force, which increasingly universities are, again, you, we don't need to even give you an answer about why you didn't get hired. Eh, we're not offering that section this year. 
you know, so again, it's a way of really constricting the methodological possibility that's available to you as a researcher, as a grounded theorist, if, if that's what you chose to do as a critical constructivist. And these are big dangers that are changing entire societies, not just education. As Michel Fine kind of said, welcome to the battle. Like, it's finally reached us. But uh, it's been going on in the K-12 to for years. You, you see it in K-12. to Every time a teacher gets deprofessionalized, every time we don't trust the teacher's assessment and we value more a standardized assessment and the state gathers that and people start to teach to the test because they have to, um, like I like what Michelle Fine says, is welcome to the battle. Like, it's finally come to us. It's, it's reached this far, the, the sort of last place left. Um, Anyone have questions specifically about grounded theory? Either way? No? Okay. Okay. Uh, what about the, the, the tension right now between the... Uh, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll cast the players as um, Alberta and Quebec and the pipeline. I think you're, that's what I think you were talking about also. Uh, the way the, the environmental assessments are being positioned or talked about, mm. um, how that's being measured, what's being measured, who has the right to measure, whether there should be one standardized measure across the country. Do we have shared values about <coughs> who should be consulted, how should they be consulted, <coughs> who's relevant at that table? That's what you're talking about. Sure. Absolutely. But that has huge... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that... That affects the birds and the fish. Also, I mean, this affects everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. There are no externalities. Right. Yeah, I think in the end, uh, right now, we're still one of the only places able to speak out. A tenured faculty member is still one of the only places where I think it's them and the Supreme Court justices to have such a thing as tenure. I, I can't think of any other. If you know of any, please tell me, because in my examples... Those are the only two I can think of. Senators? <coughs> yeah, I guess a, a senator can, uh, especially if they're non-whipped. Um, unfortunately, they seem to be whipped still. But if they were unwhipped, yeah, I, I agree. I'd say a senator, uh, Supreme Court justice, it's sort of the justices and tenured professors. I often like to think of myself as a people's senator, that it's our job to speak out and, and to critique and to provide analysis for all kinds of things that are going on in society because no one else is afforded the privileges to be able to. It's not that we're smarter in any way. It's that we have the privileges, the structural privileges of our position to be able to offer these critiques with relative impunity. And again, I've already said that this is on a sliding scale of, of, of protection and privilege. But uh, I would say... Foremost would be a full tenured white male in a professional faculty with no enrollment issues. We should be speaking out every day. I but think the, judges are feeling pretty confident. Ju uh, judges have in rebuke. Yeah, yeah because I, got a, uh, I had, was put on a conference call with a judge last week who um, took exception to uh, one of our questions for... Uh, admission to the Faculty of Education, uh, teaching is a political and moral act. I'm pretty, I'm speaking. <laughs> and um, it was very aggressive. And there were other people in the room which, whom he would not identify. And um, it, it was a very interesting. Uh, did did we confident. prevail? Well, he said, I can tell I'm not going to convince you. And I said, nor I you. <laughs> and <laughs> it, was, uh, it was difficult, though, because, you know, see this person, but I think there was full authority of all kinds of layers of privilege, privilege. being unleashed there. What? Out, out of the blue. Mm -hmm. and, and these conversations, again, are uh, there's something you can trace. In the fifth edition of this book, there's going to be a lot more talk about autoculture. Uh, about all the things that I've been talking about that in the first four editions are not there. There's a slight beginning to talk in 2011 a little bit. Uh, you got Norm Denzen talking about it, but it's largely still.
being discussed as the paradigm wars, sort of the 80s battles in a new century. But those, what's inherently different is that this is not, it, this is not disciplines fighting with each other. So it's not dialectics within and beyond disciplines. This is uh, entire restructurings that are based and, and pushed on from outside. Again, the academy's always been so, sort of uh, pushed and changed according to any era that we've been in, whether it was uh, the, you know, the era of, of empire or state or before that church, sort of religious empires, and then you had the classic empires, now the state, and, and now the market. We, we always kind of adapt and change and try to find our way. Um, but this new moment is one that even if, like I said, if you trace the discussions using things like the Handbook of Qualitative Research, you can see that these are new, and the fifth edition will have more than one chapter about it. So these discussions about audit culture have entered the methodological you know, qualitative research handbooks. That, that's how much they affect what's permitted or not for you to do as a researcher. I'm very fearful of the future in that way. It's not, there's no going back either. It's like, try to get standardized testing out of Ontario. Like, good luck. I try to, they're trying in the United States, even the president's saying this, we're testing too much and it's very difficult to take it take it back once it's implemented, and and we'll have some hard decisions as research. Keep it in the context of higher ed. We're going to have some really tough decisions because you know the UK has done this uh, REF now. It's called the REF, the Research Excellence Framework. Um, previous to that was the Research Assessment Exercise, and now they're developing one for teaching in higher ed. So your students are going to have exit exams in the UK and they're also talking about bringing that in in Canada too. I saw we're bringing in Harvey Weingarten. Uh, some, we're bringing in a speaker here who that's what he's advocating for, exit exams. Well, I think it'll work. You'll be given a course outline, and you'll be told, teach this. Well, With I these know. books and these yeah, readings. No, I, I can see how that could work. I'm thinking specifically at the U of R, at least in the departments I'm familiar with, sessionals don't always need that work. So will there be, you know, that More auditing. a lot of grad students who are willing to do that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's not hard to course people when they need to eat. Uh, and, and then the other part is you get increasingly more audits, which our own university is talking about. How do we measure research impact? Well, this is not a benign thing. It's, it's about coercing your behavior to do certain things because that's how indicators work. As soon as they become targets, you teach to the test. And that happens everywhere they're implemented. And the most egregious example is the body count in the Vietnam War. McNamara... He's a tailorist He's about literally cars, manufacturing, helps rebuild Ford, gets hired, uh, gets the job of uh, Secretary of Defense and institutes the body count. And then you get any body counts. So what does that do on the battlefield? You start killing everybody. And that actually happened. Like the, that's how they can uh, spiral to great horrific descent. The, the, the using indicators as a target. And for us, it would be journal articles. Well, then you're too busy doing journal articles to do any other kind of work, even though scholarship is much more broadly uh, conceptualized than a journal article. And, and that's happening. And in New Zealand, uh, it does all kinds of subtle stuff. You value international work. Well, you're actually privileging white males because, one, the indigenous women who more likely work in universities there do local work and also got their degrees locally because they're doing all kinds of other work and, and don't have the networks built that the white males who come from the UK who are working in New Zealand have. Um, but by having the indicator of international work, 
you devalue or you downplay the value of local work, indigenous work, women, the work that women typically do in New Zealand to this other stuff. And then you add funding to it and all of a sudden you really create a disparate system as time goes on. And that's exactly what's happening. In fact, they're thinking about tweaking the indicators because no one wants to do government public policy work in New Zealand. They're finding, well, we got the government wants this work done and no one's taking it up because it's not counted. So, but their idea of doing it, the idea is not to just develop a better indicator. That's the mistake because you're still just going to create a new game. The game is played by the rules. You tell me the rules and that's what the game, that's what happens. Um, and, and it's very much what happens in research. And it's very frightening. Make no mistake, you're, you're going into a very different field if you're entering research and, and higher ed than it was even when I started. And, and increasingly, I got the opportunity to go to Texas to talk about that. Like people want to, this is the new, this is what's going on right now in the talk about things. It's uh, audit culture is transforming the work that we do and what's available for us to do. Our methodological imagination itself. Well, it is time, so oh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.